of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. We pause for a moment of silent confession before our Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and thus they deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro appointed for the day.
We pray together the column for the day. O Lord, grant that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your governors that your church may joyfully serve you in all godly quietness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday after Trinity comes from Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died, saying to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. We rise to honor our Lord in the hearing of His Gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the sixth chapter of St. Luke. Jesus said, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that it is in your brother's eye. Here endeth the gospel.
We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory, to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with our sermon hymn.
mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when I say the word bark, I imagine you all are thinking of different things. The word bark might be the sound a dog makes. You might find bark on the side of a tree. A bark may also refer to a small boat. It's a really simple point, but words mean things. Words have meaning, and context determines the meaning of those words. So if I had not said just the word bark, but if I had actually used it in a sentence, you would not be confused. You would know if I was talking about that which is on the side of a tree or the sound a dog makes or a small ship. Now why am I focused on words and their meaning? Everybody has a favorite Bible passage. The Gospel lesson seems to be a favorite Bible passage for those who never come to church. They love to remind us that it was Jesus who said, Judge not, and you will not be judged. So you Christians, stop judging me because Jesus said you cannot judge. Well, that's what the word means. But does it mean that in this context? Now, there are other people who love this text. These are people within the church. Our own Mr. Causey aside, it's normally the stewardship chair who likes to say, give and it will be given to you. The more you give, the more you get. Give to the church and you'll receive more. Well, that is what the words are saying, but is that what the words mean? Words have meaning. Jesus says, do not judge. But if you turn a few pages over in your Bible to say 1 Corinthians chapter 6, St. Paul reminds us that in fact, we will judge others. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? He's talking about you, the saints, that you will judge the world. And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? You see, he's talking about disagreements among brothers. He's actually talking about the very thing that Jesus is talking about in our gospel lesson. Brothers should not disagree to the point of having to go before an unbeliever to settle their case. That's Paul's point. And he says, do you not know you will judge the world? But then he says, do you not know that we are to judge angels? Now, which angels is he talking about? He's talking about fallen angels. He's talking about those who have denied who God is, those who have denied the very saving work that God has for us. Now, before I leave what Paul is saying here, just keep this in the balance. Jesus says, do not judge. Paul says, you're going to judge. Not only are you going to judge the world, but you're going to judge the fallen angels. But then he comes back to the disagreement among the brothers, one another, the fellow faithful. And he says, you shouldn't even have lawsuits. If you have a disagreement with a fellow believer, he says this. And this is a question for you and for me. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? If you encounter a difficult time with a fellow believer and that they have wronged you, St. Paul is asking you a question. Why not suffer wrong? Why not be defrauded? Well, let's ask it in a different way. If you're Joseph, what do you do? Your brother's turned on you. This isn't just someone that is an acquaintance and a fellow believer. This is family. They turned on you. They tried to kill you. They put you in a pit. But then they showed mercy and they decided to sell you for a few coins. You then end up in prison. Your brothers have done this to you. And then you end up rising to the rank second in charge that you could save your family. And now dad 
has passed away and the brothers are nervous. So what would you do? Look at that Old Testament lesson for just a second. Look at what Joseph says. He doesn't brush it away. He doesn't ignore what they did to him. You, what you did, you meant evil against me. Not you were confused and in ignorance, you threw me in a pit and sold me into slavery. No, what you did was wrong. It was evil what you did against me. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Now, this is a remarkable thing. Not only is Joseph suffering wrong, as St. Paul says, but he's also saying that these terrible things that happened, happened to me, he says, God had other purposes. And God actually meant it for good. Today's gospel lesson, which is our focus, and we're going to go through this. On the one hand, it's liberating. It's often misunderstood. We want to get it right. It's liberating, but it also says something really important about our lives as believers that we don't often want to talk about. We don't actually want to admit this, but here it is. Bad things happen to believers. Now, of course, bad things happen to all people, but we're talking about believers. Bad things happen to believers. Unfair things happen to believers. That's how the world puts it. We can use that language. Things that should not have happened. I shouldn't have to deal with this. I shouldn't have to suffer this wrong. And yet, Scripture is telling us something really clearly here. Yeah, bad things happen. St. Paul says, why not suffer the wrong? Can you imagine that? That's really hard. Why not suffer the wrong? But then can you go one step further and say, you know, God's up to something. I'm enduring hardship. I'm suffering. But somehow, beyond maybe my understanding, maybe I'll never even know, but somehow I do know that God is in control. He's caring for me. And he's up to something. Now Joseph gained clarity on all of that. Evil happened to him, and he understood why. The Bible is not telling us here that we will always know the why. But what we can know is that God is in control. He is governing all things. There's not a moment of your life, not a single breath that you take that he's unaware of. It kind of blows the mind. But we know that to be true. And St. Paul then says, because that's true, why not suffer the wrong? Look at the gospel lesson. Those who want to rush to verse 37 to say, judge not, have missed the context of what Jesus is saying. We have to look at that first verse. In this case, it's verse 36. Jesus said, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Now, there's a couple things that, that get my attention here. One is, in the Sermon on the Mount, that's what this is taken from. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus uses this kind of construction twice. And both seem really daunting to me. He says to you and to me, the first time he says, be perfect. Be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's putting the bar pretty high, Jesus. Here he says, be merciful, as your Father is merciful. I don't know if you have the same reaction to this, but that's putting the bar pretty high. Look at exactly what he says here, though. Before we get into what mercy is, it's not be merciful as God is merciful. No, no, no. It's not abstract at all. It's not just be merciful as God is merciful. It's be merciful as the Father is merciful. And it's actually as your Father is merciful. Now, that's important language. How do you call upon God as Father? How can you say, Abba, Father? Only by the power of God. 
Only by the Holy Spirit. Only by the Holy Spirit who turns your heart from yourself and your sin to Jesus. Only by having your eyes upon Jesus, your Lord and Savior, by the very power of the Holy Spirit at work through the means of grace, can you come to know God the Father. Scripture says this so many times. There can be no confusion about this. No one comes to the Father apart from the Son. No one knows the Father apart from the Son. No one knows the Son apart from the Spirit. When Jesus says, be merciful, we'll get to that. As your Father is merciful, He is very clearly speaking in a certain context. He's talking to you and me as believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. And He's not talking about the ups and downs of this world. He's talking about everlasting life with our Father. So what is this mercy that we come to know by the Spirit, through the Son, in the Father? We come to know that our sin, your sin, my sin, Joseph's sin, the sin of his brothers, Paul's sin, sins of Peter, the sins of Luther, the sins of all who have ever lived are upon Jesus. The payment for those sins, for your sins and the sins of others, is the cross. And the blood of our Lord shed upon the cross. Sometimes we say words and we move quickly beyond them. But just for a moment, think about that. The depth of our sin places God upon the cross. The very Son of God, who gives you breath and life, who created you, goes to the cross shedding his blood for your eternal life. This is the penalty of our sin. Sin is a massive thing. We can't understand the full weight of it because we can't fully understand the holiness of our God and the offense of our sin against that holiness. But we get a glimpse when we realize that there is only one thing that can pay for that sin, and that's God upon the cross. And thanks be to God, He not only suffered and died for our sins, but He brings us to a knowledge of that sin and the forgiveness of that sin in Jesus Christ. And this is how we come to know our Father. And this is how we come to know His mercy. You cannot pay for your sins. Only Jesus can. And in God's mercy, though you have offended His justice, though you have gone contrary to His word, He forgives you as you look to Jesus, His Son, upon the cross for your salvation and for your forgiveness. So be merciful as your Father is merciful to you. You see how the gospel changes you entirely. It gives you a completely different perspective unless you see things differently. You understand the ups and downs of this world. You understand what no unbeliever could ever understand. Give it a try. Read St. Paul's words to an unbeliever. Why not suffer wrong and be defrauded? They think that's lunacy. How could you do that? How could you turn the other cheek? How could you hand over your cloak and tunic to another? How could you do these things? Did you see the epistle lesson? Let's make it even harder. St. Paul says you should bless those who persecute you. We live in a world full of persecution, and it's probably only going to get worse. And I'm talking about in America. People hate you because you're a believer. When persecution comes to your door, St. Paul says, bless them. Repay no one evil for evil. Never avenge yourself. Leave it to the wrath of God. You see, 
you have a different perspective. On the one hand, you are going to face difficulty and God is up to something. Suffer it. Suffer it as a believer who has seen mercy and forgiveness. But also know this, those who persecute you today may be sitting next to you in the pew tomorrow. Those who hate you today may rejoice with you down the road here singing their praises to our Lord. How could they do that? St. Paul persecuted plenty of people. And now here he says, bless those who persecute you. The gospel changes us. It gives us a different perspective and it empowers us to do things we could never do on our own. Back to the gospel lesson. Now we understand what it means. Judge not and you will not be judged. Jesus is not talking about this world and the affairs of this world. He's not talking about how authorities have been handed the sword and they in fact are to constrain evil. He's not talking about parents who raise their children to know right and wrong. Nor is he talking about how believers are to beware of false prophets. When you hear false teaching, you make a judgment and you say that that is wrong. And then you point someone to scripture and show them God's truth. He's not talking about any of that. When he says, judge not, he's saying, stop acting like you're in the place of God. Leave that judgment to God. Judge not. Condemn not. You're not in the place of God. But be merciful as your Father is merciful. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. You can only give what you have. You can only share mercy when you've received mercy. You understand what it is. You can only share and give and say forgiveness when you've come to understand the forgiveness that you have. And so Jesus says, give all of these things. Give, and it will be given to you. You are freed by the gospel to go forth by the power of the Spirit living courageously and boldly in a world that is against you. And you do have the strength to suffer wrong. You do have the strength to endure the wrongs that will come to you. Jesus gives a nice illustration of this. He's talking about when women would go to the market and they would take their apron to have flour placed in the apron. Anyone who's ever put flour in a measuring cup can understand what he's getting at here. You put flour in a measuring cup, you gotta tap it down a little bit, there's air in there. You wanna get the full amount. That's what he's talking about. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put in your lap. Not only will you receive all that is yours to receive, but with God, it's always more and you will receive more. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He goes on with this parable. It's pretty straightforward at this point. The blind cannot lead the blind. Although we're very, very good and skilled at seeing the sins of others, we should reflect upon our own sin. Because again, by reflecting upon our own sin and what it is and how it is against God and how it is forgiven upon the cross by God Himself, our eyes are opened. No longer are we blinded by our own sin and transgression, but our eyes are opened for what that sin is and for the good news that it is forgiven. And we can now walk clearly in the light of God's Word knowing that we have that gift of forgiveness from Him. And we can go forth and do the remarkable things that we see Joseph doing and the incredible things that St. Paul describes for us in Romans chapter 12. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, be merciful as your Father is merciful. And forgive and give of the good gifts that He has bestowed upon you. Amen. Please rise.
Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, our light and our salvation, you are our strength. Work in us a worthy fear and constant trust in your mercy, that we would fear nothing else in this passing world. Lord, in your mercy, as your mercy is poured out in rich measure, so open the mouths of all ministers in the church to preach your blessed and saving gospel. Open the mouths of Christians to proclaim the marvels of him who called us from darkness into his marvelous light. And let our works of mercy attest to the love we have received from you. Lord, in your mercy. Your Heavenly Father, teach all your children true humility that we would learn to confess our sin rather than excusing or denying it. Keep us safe from all pride, which would lead us to disdain our fellow Christians who have received your mercy. Rather, make us rejoice at the patience you have shown to us all in forgiving our many trespasses. Lord, in your mercy, Lord of all, you raised up Joseph according to your plan to exercise authority in Egypt, working good from what was meant only for evil. Work by your power in the leaders and authorities of our nation, whom you have set in place, that many would be kept alive and protected in this life through your governments. Lord, in your mercy, your receive the groanings of your church, dear Father, as we await the redemption of our bodies and the freedom of the glory of the children of God, turn away the corruption of sin, the futility of our fallen state, and every ill of body and soul. We especially pray for Pam, Willard, Cindy, Terry, Marcia, Lori, and Robert, and our homebound Linda and Francis and all whom we now name in our hearts.
comfort us in the midst of these sufferings with the certain hope of your incomparable glory, which at last will be revealed in us. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, clear away all grudges, unbelief and impenitence from us, that we may eat and drink your Son's body and blood with lively faith in his promises and receive the forgiveness you give in this blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are merciful and through Christ have promised that you will ne neither judge nor condemn us, but graciously forgive all our sins and abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. By your Holy Spirit, establish in our hearts a confident faith in your mercy. Teach us in turn to be merciful to our neighbor, that we may not judge or condemn others, but willingly forgive all, and judging only ourselves, lead blessed lives in your fear. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament found on page 194. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
to the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We continue with our final hymn for the morning. 